Doctor, I know we're running low on time, and I want to take this opportunity. I'm sitting down with America's doctor. I don't see my doctor nearly enough, so I, I'm going to use this as my own personal telehealth session. I've been diagnosed with <laughs> gout, and uh, I know it's usually a disease that people in the 1700s get, but I, a 27-year-old male, uh, have gout. And I've been told I need to cut out red meat, I need to cut out all purines and alcohol. But I read somewhere on the deep internet that gin could be beneficial and anti-inflammatory for gout. Would you sign off on gin as a potential cure or salve for gout? Jordan, I would love to do you a solid, but I cannot sign off on gin as an appropriate treatment for, Come on. Uh, for gout. I'm Doctor, so sorry. he's got a behavioral issue here now. Come on. <laughs> Okay, Jordan, a little question for you. I've been thinking about this for a little bit. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what would you be doing? You mean specifically a podcast with you? No, I would, I would, no, I'd be no. catching well, up okay, on that'd sleep, be one I'd thing. be learning how you to know, play the bass. I'm, I'm talking about what, what profession would you be in if you weren't in the uh, area of comedy? You know, it's interesting you say, I wonder if this kid, we, we did an interview the other day, uh, and I think I mentioned how I didn't have a backup plan when I was getting into comedy, and I wonder if that sparked your interest there. I'm just trying to it I'm did. trying to piece apart. Yeah, I'm, I'm piecing apart your your mindset here. Th- that's a good question. I do think it is true. I was pretty. F- I found comedy because I fell in love with performing. I fell in love with improv, and then I fell in love with the community, and it really was sort of all consuming. And so I do say, like, part of the reason I stuck with it wasn't wasn't because I was particularly great at it. It was because I, I didn't have a plan B. I I don't I still don't have a plan B and I, I, that's as somebody who's aging into an industry that doesn't let you age beyond the age of twenty seven which I am right now I'm twenty seven I understand that eventually you'll have to expand and I think like that's where in this world you expand in terms of producing writing or doing podcasts with uh, governors so yeah. that I'm exploring beyond that I I. I I don't have it. I have a joke answer. I could say uh, I'd be do I'd be a professional basketball player. I could say you know right. I could I could go for a dirtier joke answer. I could say I'd be a porn star. Why do you want- have to? Why does it change when you get to be twenty seven? How come you you know what's what's the problem there? Well, this industry is evil, and I think look like and and also half of what television and film tends to sell is you sell youth and you sell sexiness. When you put yourself on a big screen, they tend to want to look at faces that look younger and more chiseled. Now, when you sling jokes, you usually can extend that age range a little bit longer. And so that's where the world of satirical comedians don't find themselves in the land of manicurists uh, right at first, to say the least. But I I do think it's a harder uh, uh, industry to age into and also it's an industry that's looking to find youthful fresh ideas partially because to get into the economics of it the money of this industry is who between the ages of 18 and 34 what what do 18 to 34 year olds watch and how do they watch it and so if you're in your 50s making tv shows for your compadres people are like that's nice your compadres uh don't buy the advertisements we're trying to sell we're looking to sell to 19 year olds so it's it's difficult and i think you have to get creative with it and i think the people i've i'm inspired by in this industry learn to grow with it they become producers they expand they write they write books they write more um, well, how old is Chappelle? how old is he I think he's 27 as well. I think we're oh, all really? 27. All 27. And then, uh, okay, so I have another one other idea about what you might do. Okay. How about politics? Politics. You know what? I think it, it'd just be too easy, you know? Uh, <laughs> what do you do? You play off people's fears, you tell people what they want to hear, <laughs> and then you, uh, you redraw the district so you never get kicked out. Simple. I, I, I want a challenge. Okay, so you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that. I, do you I think I could wife... do it? What, what do you, What do you think about a comedian like me? I I, I I have thought about that idea, the idea of public service, and talking right. to you about it. I think I, I would like to serve. Quite frankly, the more I cover it, the more frustrating it seems. It doesn't seem like you have the ability to do the things you want. Most of your time is spent uh, caught up in the bureaucracy. Tell me, I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, I mean, everything is a struggle, but no, I think you could you could go in there and be impactful. Maybe you you get on the New York City Council. 
Oh, or you become so. a member of the legislature. Why You're not? Talking. I mean, I, I don't think tell I would... your wife I've been bringing this up because <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to be on the wrong side of her. Um, I think and, I'd bypass local. Don't, shouldn't I go straight for national office? You see you what J.D. Like Vance Congress, is doing? Yeah, yeah, or Senate or President. Yeah. Well, I mean, well look at Zelensky, you know? <laughs> look you're at right. what he's done. I mean, comedians right now, they're, they're the ones on who the are rise. standing up they're to the big tough right guys. Now. Uh, this they're, this they're is the hot. time for comedians. Gonna, would you vote for a comedian for president? <laughs> Based on a lot of the choices I have, why not? <laughs> you know? <laughs> All yeah. right. Well, speaking of somebody who is uh, who left the private sector and is in the uh, in the government, why don't we uh, why don't we get to our guest? Yeah, we got a very exciting guest today. Uh, we get some answers today. Uh, our guest today is America's doctor, the nineteenth and twenty first Surgeon General of the United States. He was first appointed by President Obama in twenty fourteen, serving until twenty seventeen, making him the first Surgeon General of Indian descent. And then in March twenty twenty one, President Biden appointed him as the twenty first Surgeon General of the United States, entering his job in the middle of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, a real fun time to jump on the job. And since then, he's focused on health worker well-being and the need for continued COVID response funding, addressing health misinformation, the youth mental health crisis, and community and connection as antidotes to loneliness and isolation among Americans. Uh, This is Dr. Vivek Morthy. Doctor, thanks for coming on the show. Well, I'm so glad to be with you, Jordan, and hello, Governor. Thanks for having me on. There's a lot to get into, doctor. Um, you're, you're sort of the resident, you're America's doctor. You're a resident expert. And I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that's, you know, information, news that's coming uh, even this week. This week, the CDC announced that COVID-19 has infected most Americans at least once. I'm wondering where that puts us as a country uh, with so many people that could be dealing with long-term side effects. Like what kind of stress does that put on our healthcare system? Well, Jordan, it, it's a really good question. And I do think the last two and a half years of this pandemic, almost two and a half years, have put enormous stress and strain uh, on individuals. We're approaching a million people who have lost their lives to COVID-19. We've had, you know, as you noted, uh, well, likely a majority of the country uh, who has been infected at some point during this pandemic. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll just say this to somebody who's had many family and friends who've gotten sick, who's lost 10 family members to COVID-19. Uh, it's hard to put a... Uh, a, a real price on, on the pain that we've been through because uh, it's a loss not only of individuals but people have uh you know it's a loss of like ideals a loss of dreams many people have deferred getting married have uh you know have to, to move across the country to be with uh those they love and have had to leave jobs and communities behind people have made big changes in their lives um and one of my worries uh, is that in the months ahead that we will try to move on as if the pandemic never happen and just get back to our lives in 2019. I think the reality is what we have to do is try to get to the end of this pandemic as quickly as you can, but also take the time to process what happened to us, to reflect on what we went through together, which was really a collective as well as an individual trauma, and then talk about how we can actually build a community, a society that's even better than what we had pre-pandemic, that's better in terms of responding to pandemics, but also it's better in terms of addressing the mental health crisis that we've had for a long time, but which we need to do a whole lot more about. Doctor, you know, uh, boy, I understand everything you just said, but when we look at COVID today, you know, this is something the rules are so, they change, it seems like, on an hourly basis. You know, what's, I think what's hard for people is how do you allow 100,000 people to go into a stadium and cheer for a football team like they do up at the University of Michigan or here at Ohio State? How do you allow them to go, and they're all in there together next to one another, and then you were telling them, oh, no, no, but you need to wear a mask if you're in this building, and you don't wear one if you're in the other building. All these rules, doctor. I mean, I understand in the beginning, we didn't really know what we were dealing with, but now we know a lot more of what we're dealing with, yet the rules continue to be confusing, which creates cynicism in the minds of people. I, I was just coming back from vacation. I was in, in New York and they were saying on the, the little tram, put your mask on. I looked around, nobody had a mask on. It was like, I didn't even hear anything. What are we going to do about these rules? Well, Governor, it's just a really important question. And I do think uh, you're right that both developing these rules and then communicating them and then having people follow them has been a challenge throughout this pandemic. Part of it has been that 
know, as we've learned more, uh, the CDC and public health institutions have tried to modify their recommendations based on that learning. But we also exist in a, in a federated structure when it comes to public health in the United States. So it's not like there's one body that makes uh, the rules and then like, and those are the rules that are executed and implemented all over the country. We have a system where local departments of health, uh, where local communities, where states can make decisions on which rules uh, they choose to follow. Take it, for example, um, you know, wearing masks uh, in public places. Uh, that is actually not something that's under the CDC's control. The federal government can make rules around around the narrow sector. They can, for example, make rules around, or at least historically have made rules around masks in planes and in federal buildings and on, on buses and trains. But whether or not you have to wear a mask when you go into a local restaurant or not, uh, or into a lo local gym, those are based on your locality. And when you have different locations making different decisions, um, I can absolutely understand how they can feel confusing to people when they look around and say, what's right you know, here? And the truth is that there's a range. I, I, I follow that, but let me ask you this. Yeah. Most of these stadiums or arenas that people go to, they're owned by yeah. the public, but you don't require masks in, in the arena. So here I'm sitting next to 30,000 people cheering on the New York Nets or crying the fact that they didn't win. Careful, and, stay and, neutral. You know, and there's, there's like everybody around me has no mask on. Mm -hmm. But if I get on an airplane, then I have to wear a mask. Although halfway through the flight, they tell me I don't have to wear a mask. I mean, you see the problem. It's just people oh, don't know yeah. what to think and they don't know what to believe. Yeah. In one minute, you have Fauci who says the pandemic's over. And then 24 hours later, you go, whoops, I guess I went too far. Now I got to... I mean, this, what are we going to do here, sir? Doctor? Yeah, so listen, I think the broad thing is you're right that in, in, in an evolving pandemic, like it is one of the hardest things to do, uh, even harder, I think, at times in the science, uh, the development of vaccines is getting the communication right and making sure that people, uh, you bring people along as, as your thinking evolves. There are two things I would say, though, in this government. One is that just the example you shared about planes and stadiums, for example, that's an interesting example also where the planes, you know, the, during the last couple of years, the rules on planes were based on the federal government's advice. When you go to stadiums, uh, for example, that is not based on what the federal government's rules are. Uh, even though they are maybe public entities, those are under more state and local control. Um, and so you'll find different decisions being made in different states and localities. But your broader point is, is I think, the important one, which is that this is going to be one of the challenges, not only because of COVID, but think about it with future pandemics, because there's a process of science here that's happening out in the open and public, right? Which, you know, to people like me and perhaps both of you and others who may be close to the scientific enterprise at point parts of your life and familiar with the scientific process, you might recognize, okay, well, all this debate between scientists and involved in guidelines, yeah, this is kind of how science is done. It's messy, but, but this is sort of how it's done. Um, but if you're not familiar with that process and you're trying to just figure out what can I do I need to do in my own life, you know, to like, you know, go out and be safe, to take care of my family, and you can see these guidelines shifting and changing and think, gosh, do people really know what they're talking about? This seems really confusing. Um, and so I think as a scientific enterprise, we've got work to do uh, to be better about how we communicate transparently to the public. But we've also got to help the public understand what the scientific process is like. And during this pandemic, it's been tough because we were learning as we went. And sometimes I meant we had to change our guidance. I guess it's interesting because I, I go out to a lot of rallies. I talk to a lot of people who are frustrated with the governmental response. They're frustrated with what they see as infringements on their own personal rights. And they often turn to moments where uh, uh, recommendations have shifted. And I think what you talk about is the scientific community is one, th this thing evolved. We learned information, we adapted to the information that we learned, uh, and it also grew in a way that we had to keep changing and adapting. So I, I empathize with this conversation and get frustrated with the other people who feel immobile to one thing that they heard four months ago. When you look at some of these little moments here, uh, where we hope things could have been done better or can be done better, is it, are we talking about certain failures in communication, or do we need to call out the failures in comprehension that many Americans have? Oh, Jordan, it's a really interesting question because communication is both about what you put out and what's received, right? And all the factors that impact both sides of that coin. Uh, and I think we do have challenges on both sides, right? That we have to be able to communicate clearly, consistently, and effectively. We have to be able to communicate what's based in science uh, we have to ensure that people know what's accurate information and generally backed by the scientific community and what may not be in fact based in evidence and science, but even if it's widely circulating. 
and that gets to the point of preparing people uh, to consume this information. Well, 20, 30 years ago, we had a very different information environment, right? You had far fewer sources of information, far fewer channels of platforms in which the information was spreading. But right now, it, people are experiencing utter and total information overload uh, in many cases. And it's and what's different also is the speed and sophistication and, and scale, really, with, with which misinformation is spreading. So sometimes it's really hard to tell uh, what's accurate and what's not. So I think this what this calls for is a, a broader effort around digital health literacy that we have to engage in, not just for future pandemics in health, but just more broadly. Because I, as a doctor, I can tell you I've had many episodes where a patient has come to me and said, hey, I saw a, an ad for this, this pill that I'm told is like the perfect cure for my condition. Can I get a prescription for it? And the reality might be more complicated. Maybe it's actually not the right pill for them once you read the fine print and everything. Um, but, you know, people are encountering a lot of information about health. They're not always sure how to process it. I think we need to do a better job also helping prepare people. Uh, and that's what digital health literacy is about. You know, a, a lot of times, however, uh, with respect to both of you, it's not always a communication problem. <laughs> if the rules are screwy, the communication, I don't care how you communicate, so on one hand, we tell people, you got to go out and you got to get vaccinated and you got to get boosted. And then we say, okay, now we have to test you to see if you have it when you've been boosted and, uh, you know, and fully vaccinated. It's like it confuses people. Wait a minute. I have, I got vaccinated, but now you want me to now go additional, get additional tests or wear a mask. Why did I get vaccinated to begin with? You know, because now what they're beginning to say is if you had the disease, right, that you're you you could be safer than if you actually went and got and got a vaccine. I mean, it's you see, it's it's the rules and the changing rules that lend to the confusion of communicating. Although I do recognize uh, what both of you said, it's a changing environment. I mean, I, I we thought we had Ebola in Ohio, and well, when we heard that, you know, I started going around and and talking to everybody, the nurses, the doctors. There was one lady that wanted to leave her house and go to the go to the islands. I said, no, that is, just isn't going to happen. And I think there was a matter of there has been a matter here of of evolution. But I still think you need to be on top of these rules um, and make and communicate them clearly because I think the rules are not clear. Yeah, you know, Governor, I, look, I, I take your point, and I think there's a communication element even there, too, when you communicate about what the goal is, right, of a certain intervention or rule. And I think that's a yeah. place where we got to think about, too, right? So think about vaccines for a moment. Like, what's the goal of being vaccinated? Well, I think the idea that was conveyed to people, in part based on these trials that had amazing results in the early days, was that if you get vaccinated, you won't get infected, right? The reality is that the 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 most important goal of the vaccine is actually to save your life and keep you right. out of the hospital. Keep you out of the hospital, you, right. You might still get infection, but an infection, but if you do, it'll probably be mild. Now, your chances of getting infected are still lower, but they're not zero. So that's why you're seeing so many people who got vaccinated and boosted. You know, many of them get these mild infections. I was one of them, right? I got vaccinated and boosted. My wife did as well, but- I've been boosted our, twice. I mean, I'm, I just, just, I, oh, just give me another one. I'll, you know, I mean, that's, it's interesting what you're saying, but go yeah, ahead, sir. But, I'm sorry. You're, you're, no, but you're raising a really good point because if if that point is not clear, and I don't think it was clear to enough people that the, what the most important goal of the vaccine is, then every mild case you see in a vaccinated person seems like it's a vaccine failure, right? And it seems like you're being asked to do something that doesn't have real utility. And then it seems like a waste of time, right? And so this is where I think we've, um, you know, we've got a, there's got to be a, I think an important process of reflection we go through after this pandemic. And frankly, yeah. shouldn't wait till after the pandemic. But where we got to think through everything from, like, how do we make sure we can develop the right tools uh, for people, whether it's vaccines, treatments, et cetera? How do we make sure we can communicate that? And how do we really build the partnerships and trust that we need at a community level before the next pandemic comes in? Because uh, yeah, as yeah. you know, Governor, yeah. you've run a state and managed yeah. many crises. You know that the the best time to build trust is before the crisis actually comes. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I mean, I I, I hear this the, these these little moments where somebody uh, gets infected and it's seen as a vaccine failure, but also it gets amplified as a vaccine failure. Um, it gets weaponized, it gets politicized, and so people don't know what to trust, and it becomes uh, information that attacks who they are, their identity, and their political points of view, as opposed to just uh, starting to understand the science. And I think I, I want to talk a little bit more about. Uh, 
that uh, glut of information, much of it misinformation. Uh, people are going to places like Twitter for um, the latest information. They're seeing what is getting retweeting, what's getting passed around by their friends and colleagues, and that tends to be where they're getting a lot of their, their medical information. Twitter looks like it's going to be bought by Elon Musk, uh, and he's taking that over a, as well. Uh, I think when you look at a space like that as a space where people are getting their, their health information and engaging in a dialogue there, how worried are you about these, these places where the health information is getting dissected and passed around? Well, I do worry about the spread of health misinformation on social media platforms uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because uh, when we talk to people in the community, including a lot of nurses and doctors who are encountering patients who have false beliefs about COVID or the vaccine, et cetera, the vast majority of the time when they ask their patients, where did you encounter this misinformation? They're saying, oh, on social media. Um, I also worry because you know, our communication mechanisms and tools have become really sophisticated these days, such that it's pretty tough to tell for some people what's real and what's not real. And that can, we saw in the time of COVID that can have life and death consequences for them. I think that what we have to do, though, is, is find a way um, to, again, equip people with tools uh, to be able to better uh, distinguish between credible and non-credible sources uh, when it comes to scientific health information. Uh, but I also think that, you know, the platforms themselves, you know, they're private platforms, like you know, most of these social media uh, entities, they, they can create their own rules, et cetera. Uh, but I do think that they have some responsibility to consider how they can best help guide people, you know, away from harmful health misinformation and toward uh, accurate misinformation, accurate health information, because that can make a difference uh, for their health and well-being. You know, maybe maybe what we need to do on that, because it's not just on COVID, there's been health, health misinformation. It's been a lot of different places, is that maybe we ought to have a, a, a team that really can be on Twitter, a team that can be engaging in the social media out of your operation or somewhere that can say, hey, here's what people are saying, give us an answer, and let's fight fire with fire. Let's just put it all out there and let people respond. And you know, and I think there's been an effort to try to do that, but I think more of that uh, should be done. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. Doctor, what I am worried about, and I, I'm not sure I'm worried about this, you know, it's a concern, but it's the issue of public health. Because, and I've been involved with the public health uh, discussions. I was on the bipartisan coalition to, to deal with public health. I may do some work in public health. My sense is, is that if you leave the COVID debate out and you talk to people locally about, you know, the kids' swimming pool being safe, that the restaurants are clean, that we don't have to entangle the whole public health and the need for proper public health funding and get it confused with COVID. And if you don't connect it with COVID, perhaps you can have a robust public health program in our country. Or do you think that they're too closely tied? What, what's your view? You know, I do think you're on to something really important here, Governor, which is that COVID has become public health in, in the eyes, I think, of many people. And there's a whole world of public health and public health funding that is separate from that. And you know, the place where there's overlap is in, for example, things like our public health infrastructure, our data systems in our local departments of health, our staffing in our local departments of health. They serve not just COVID, but many other public health functions. And they were decimated during the 2008 Great Recession. And even when the economy came back, in many communities, those state budgets never came back. And we saw actually those challenges uh, during the last two years in the COVID pandemic. But I do think you're right that there, there I think, should be a broader conversation about public health. Most people's lives, even though they've been dominated by COVID in the last two years, they care about a whole lot more than COVID, right? They, they also care about how do they prevent yeah. their kid, you know, family from getting heart disease. And they see have relatives with diabetes and they want to know how they can prevent complications right. from that. They see, you know, dementia setting in in some of their elderly relatives and are wondering, how do I manage this? And how do I make sure I can give, give care to my elderly family members and, uh, and get the support I need for my community and my uh, my local departments of health. So people have much broader interests. And I think they, the challenge uh, now, and this is something I worry about, and certainly would be interested in your, both of your thoughts on this, is how do we engage people on the issues of public health now at a time where people are so fatigued uh, from this pandemic? And, and you know, I think in many ways have turned off from conversations about health. Uh, that's what I find myself thinking about uh, on most days is how to re-engage people on the issues that really matter. Doctor, I, let, me, let me just, Jordan, I'm sorry to jump in. Let me just, 
I, I think that public health is something that we see all the time. It is, like I say, I want to have clean water. I need to make sure there's not lead in the, you know, in the pipes, right? I want to make sure that when I take my kid to the swimming pool, that the, the water is safe. I want to make sure that when I go out with my family to a restaurant, that that's being inspected. That's where I think public health affects all of us on a daily yes. basis. If you try to work COVID into that, I think you're going to find people are going to roll their eyes. But I do. we do not want people to get sick in a restaurant or have these problems in a swimming pool or, you know, or, or building safe or whatever. I think that's what we have to focus on. Not the not the bigger issue, but that. I think that can build support for it at the community level. Sorry, Jordan. So my, my fear with all of this, when we talk about public health, we talk about a public, you need to have a shared narrative to get on the same page with this. I think the idea that we have to take COVID off the table in the conversation is frightening to me, but I think it speaks to a larger problem, which is if you have no shared narrative or shared trust, uh, do you even have a chance at building any kind of robust public health movement? Um, you know, when I go and talk to people, people are distrustful of the government. If, if the, the information they're going to get, sadly, I don't know if they're going to trust and or seek out Dr. Murthy and the work that you've done. They're going to look to people in their camp to tell them that. And so I, I have a much more cynical and fearful view that what we're witnessing is is not just one situation where a virus uh, has, has taken over a million lives in this country and it became politicized and it's an aberration, but more so it's the canary in the coal mine that's telling us we can't build a public narrative anymore. We're going to have trouble from here on out when we address big issues in the realm of public health. Jordan, from the, from the standpoint of how you do this, where I would I would just disagree with you on the issue of COVID because it got so politicized for a variety of different reasons. But when you think about you talk about the building block of a community, okay, like where you live, where I live, where the doctor lives, it at the at the really building block community level, people want to have these safe pools and safe food and safe buildings and and a way in which to control you know blood pressure or diabetes and all that I, I I'm not too cranked up about the fact that we're not going to have covid in the middle of that I just want to make sure we can get the funding at the local level at the state level and some funding at the federal level that gets to those issues covid will begin to help will take care of itself in my opinion over time because uh, we're going to probably have another vaccination at some point. I mean, it's going to be like the flu. Every year, we're going to have to probably get something. But I'm optimistic, uh, Jordan, honestly, that by leaving COVID out, we're not leaving out the essential issue of of public health. I think you that's where you got to get people who disagree to just just leave that one out, and let's make sure we don't let everybody else down where we live. That's my... Doctor, I don't know. Would you want to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think... What's happened in part is I think COVID has taken up all of the oxygen in the room. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I agree with both of you that it is. Is that a medical, that's a time. medical analysis? <laughs> that's yes, I measured the oxygen and it is, yes, been consumed by COVID. <laughs> okay, okay, good enough. <laughs> but, but I think that um, what's important is that there's a, this word narrative you mentioned, Jordan, which I think is, is important here, which is that I, I worry that we have, there's a story that I think is a true story about America and about society more broadly, where we are truly interdependent, where we need each other, uh, and we are best when we are working together, investing in one another, lifting each other up. And that means investing in public health measures that will help keep all of us safe. Uh, but I think that broader narrative of how we need to stick together and be together as a community to help make things safe for everyone, I worry that that collective narrative has been lost, uh, you know, in recent years, not just because of COVID, but even prior to that. And I think one of the great challenges we are now facing is how do we bring the community together again? Because my belief is that we're not just a nation of 330 million people who just happen to be living in the same spot. Um, I think that we are a nation of people who have shared values, who are better when we're working together, supporting one another, when we're there for each other. When we recognize that we can't do every single thing by ourselves, right? But uh, we can't build every road we need. We can't make sure every swimming pool is clean that our kids swim in. Like, we need to invest in the services to make sure the community is safe for all of us. Um, I would love to see that spirit reawakened. I think it's going to take 
leaders going to communities and having those conversations, starting with listening to what people want, what they care about, what they've been through, what they're worried about, and then helping to build that narrative and then the investments that'll support it. The big news story, health news story that came out this week is it looks like they're going to be overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, as America's doctor, do you have concerns about the health ramifications of that decision? Well, I do. You know, my belief has been that health decisions are best made between uh, patients and their healthcare providers. And I think, you know, these are very personal, nuanced decisions, whether it's about, uh, you know, your reproductive health or whether it's about other treatments you receive or whether it's about what preventive measures you take. And it is difficult for anyone outside of that relationship uh, between an individual and their healthcare provider to truly understand all the factors that go into making that decision. We don't understand all the pain and nuance and circumstances in people's lives. And so I think out of humility, we should allow people to make those decisions with the people they trust. And generally speaking, those are their healthcare providers. You didn't go to med school with Brett Kavanaugh, did you? He, <laughs> did he go to med school? I don't know if he went to school. I'll, I'll look it up. I'll Google it. Hey, hey doctor, let me, let me uh, ask you about something that I found uh, in, in reading more about you, something that it really struck me, and I think it's true, and that is the, the issue of loneliness that you talk about. Would you, would you talk about what, wh- why you wrote a book on it, what, what's contained in the book, what's important about it, and what we can do about it? Absolutely. Well, thanks for asking about this, Governor. This is not an issue. If you had told me like six years ago, hey, I'd be you know, doing this conversation with, uh, with the governor and Jordan talking about loneliness, I'd say, yeah, that doesn't seem quite right. Um, but what happened to me, uh, Governor, is that a few years ago when I was serving as Surgeon General the first time around, um, I went to communities around the country just to listen and to understand uh, what people needed as I was starting my job. And as I listened, I, I heard all of these unexpected stories about loneliness. And no one would come up to me and say, you know, hi, my name's John, my name's Jordan, I'm lonely, I'm the big, I'm lonely. They would say things like, you know, I, I feel like I have got to deal with all these problems in my life by myself. Everything's on my shoulders. Or they would say, you know, I feel if I disappeared tomorrow, no one would even care. Or I, I walk around and I just feel invisible all the time. And I was hearing this from people across the age spectrum, including and especially young people on college campuses and in high schools who are surrounded by lots of folks and connected by social media, but were feeling profoundly alone. And it's a couple of things that, that that brought up for me. One is, as I started to look into the scientific data around it, I realized that loneliness was more than a bad feeling, but it was associated with physical and mental health outcomes with a greater incidence of depression and anxiety, but also heart disease, premature death, dementia, and the list goes on. And it reminded me of my own personal experiences. And as a child, I struggled a lot with loneliness and isolation, feeling left out, feeling like I didn't belong. And over time, that really eroded my confidence and self-esteem, my sense of self-worth. But as a doctor, I was seeing this a lot in my patients. You know, I never took a class on isolation and loneliness in medical school or residency, but I will tell you that from the day I set foot in the hospital as a third year medical student, patient after patient that I encountered was in fact dealing with loneliness. When big decisions would come up, when we had to, for example, make a decision on uh, a major treatment or on when I had to break news about a new diagnosis, sometimes I would ask them, you know, was there somebody you'd like me to call so that we can be together? I know this is gonna be a tough conversation. And often they would say, you know, I wish there was somebody, but there's nobody. uh, So I'll just have a conversation by myself. And even in the final moments of of life, you know, we think of our our, our death as a time where hopefully we are surrounded by the people we love and, you know, by good memories. Um, And there were many people I cared for over the years in those final moments who had no one. It was just me and the medical staff uh, around them who were their final witnesses, uh, you know, for their last moments. So that's what got me deeply concerned about this is as I looked at the data, I realized that loneliness is more common than diabetes uh, in our country. And it's consequential for our physical and mental health. And I think it's not just even about health. I think the disconnection and lack of community that we are experiencing has an impact on civic engagement. Uh, We know now from data, it impacts productivity in the workplace. It impacts how our kids do in the classroom. But I just can't think, uh, Governor Jordan, of how as a country, we encounter crises, whether it's another pandemic, whether it's climate change, whether it's other challenges, and how we pull together in the face of those crises if we are feeling profoundly isolated and disconnected from one another. 
do you think we're mature enough to have the loneliness conversation? I, I and, and knowing that you worked on this book uh, before COVID hit, I know it feels like we all got a crash course in the effects of loneliness over these last few years. Many people in my family who have been affected by it in these last few years, many close friends who have this deep sense of alienation uh, that was heightened over these years, and like what what is what is a medical diagnosis for a path forward uh when we are this vulnerable but i don't know if our strong suit is reflection on that vulnerability i think there's something built in the american character to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just plow ahead and i think that's that's perhaps a, a dangerous uh plan of action uh, given what we've just been through i'll tell you what i I'm not sort of based on theory but my lived experience the last couple of years talking about this topic with folks around the country is I actually have found that to a surprising degree that people are quite eager and open to engage on this issue. And I think part of it is because many people are struggling in silence and they see people around them who, and they, who they love who are struggling with loneliness and isolation. I mean, I've even heard from, I mean, I've heard from CEOs, from members of Congress and others behind closed doors that to all the world, these people look like they're deeply connected. But many of them tell me behind closed doors that they are struggling too. So I think because of that shared experience, uh, people are more willing to, to listen and engage on this topic. But I think the pandemic has also uh, accentuated that feeling of loneliness and that experience, the pain of isolation for so many people. Uh, and I just came back, for example, from a trip where I was doing a few town halls uh, about this issue of some, uh, you know, loneliness and disconnection. Uh, and I'll tell you that this issue resonates more deeply, I've found, with people than any other issue I have worked on as Surgeon General, whether it's COVID, the opioid epidemic, um, whatever it might be. Um, people seem hungry to rebuild connection and community. They may not always know how, they may not always feel comfortable talking about it publicly, but just keep in mind this, that the effort to build a more connected life, a more people-centered society, this is not an effort to transform people into something unnatural, into something they're not. This is an effort to return to who we have evolved to be over thousands of years, so who we truly are, which is a species that's fundamentally deeply connected to one another, where we know that together we can actually be better. We can, like thousands of years ago, if you were that loner who decided, I'm just going to do it on my own, I don't need anybody else, what happened to you is you probably got eaten by a predator uh, or you starved from an insufficient food supply. Uh, so we've evolved to be a connected species. We may have gotten away from that in recent years, but this is our time to come back home. Well, let's say you're lonely. Let's say you're one of the people that might be listening to this podcast. Uh, what can you do if you're lonely? What, what steps can you take and then for us who can observe somebody who's lonely or isolated, what can we do? So the good news is that there is a lot that one can do if they're lonely, but also that folks around them can do. But the first thing is to recognize if you are lonely, that you are not broken uh, or deficient in some way, that you, know, you are a human being going through human experience and many, many people are struggling with, with loneliness. So that's one important thing. The second is to realize that the loneliness is actually not uh, a, a bad sign in and of itself. It's an alert, just like hunger or thirst that through which our body is telling us we're lacking something we need for survival, that's human connection. Because we are hardwired for connection, it turns out little things can make a diff big difference in how connected we feel. So for example, if you just put 15 minutes aside each day to connect with someone you love, that could be through a phone call, a visit, uh, sending a message to them, over time that can have a big difference in how connected you feel. If you take the time that you have with your loved ones, and do one other thing, which is to give them the gift of your full attention, to put away your phone when you're talking to the folks you love. Even if that means you have fewer less time to talk to them, you will find that your attention has the power of stretching time. It can make five minutes feel like 30 minutes. Um, it's one of the reasons why when you go to visit a doctor and when they give you your full attention, it feels so good. When you, a friend gives you their full attention, it feels uh, ex extraordinary. And the third thing I would mention that individuals can do is actually, this is a counterintuitive one, but it's to serve others. Now you might think, well, if I'm lonely and struggling, shouldn't other people be helping me? Uh, but it turns out when we serve others, we not only forge a powerful connection with another human being, but we remind ourselves that we have value to bring to the world. And that is so important because loneliness erodes our sense of self-esteem over time. It makes us think that we're lonely because we're not likable. That's not the case. And if you're somebody out there who's got a family member or friend who you think is struggling with loneliness, one of the most powerful things you can do is is simply showing up for them in their life, asking them how they're doing and waiting to listen uh, to see how they are, inviting them to engage uh, with you on activities, whether it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, or in a small group, um, making sure they know that you are there for them uh, and that you see them 
uh, for who they are, a being who's worthy of love. Um, because I'll tell you that one of the things that I asked a friend a long time ago, how would you define a friend? Uh, and he told me, he said, a friend is somebody who reminds you of who you are when you forget. We all forget at times. We all need people in our lives to do that. And so there's a lot of the steps that we can take in our lives to address loneliness uh, in our lives and the lives of others. So your prescription is to pay attention to my family. Hard pass. Not going to happen. <laughs> also, I want to know I the hope difference. Your family's not listening to this podcast, Jordan. <laughs> oh, no, that's the problem. They're so lonely because I'm always so busy with my stuff that they're listening to all of this. It's the only way we connect. I'm kidding. I love them. They're listening right now, be out of love. Also, what is the difference between loneliness and neediness? Uh, I'm asking for a comedian friend of mine. <laughs> you don't have to answer well, that. <laughs> Actually, I, w- I want to change gears a little bit here. I want to talk uh, a political issue that you've spoken out on the past, uh, guns uh, and gun control. You've talked about guns as a health issue. Uh, I did a special on uh, gun control and guns in America. And we have a hard time in this country talking about uh, the issue with gun violence in America. And one of the ways people do talk about dealing with that is addressing it as a public health crisis. And even from a technical aspect, that even can help getting funding for research on gun deaths and ways in which we could lower those gun deaths. Uh, do you still approach it in your role as a public health crisis? And do you expect to to use your role to speak out more about the gun issues uh, uh, America has? I do still believe that gun violence is a public health issue. And for the simple reason that whenever you have large numbers of people dying for preventable reasons, that's a public health issue, whether it's from motor vehicle accidents or from gun violence or other causes. So uh, I don't see a reason to carve out gun violence from all the different types of violence uh, you know, that, that we experience in this country. I think what's important, though, is uh, that we, number one, understand the problem in, in greater depth in terms of what's driving it, what we can do about it. For many years, uh, we did not have the federal funding uh, in adequate measure to actually do that research, and which is actually perplexing to, to many researchers and scientists on the outside, because we put lots of money into other causes of, and drivers of death, like diabetes and heart disease, uh, and motor vehicle accidents, for example. Uh, but thankfully, I'm grateful that on a bipartisan basis, Congress a couple of years came together to allocate funding to the CDC to do research uh, on gun violence. And that was a good first step. And, and I hope that that will continue uh, and that we will have see more funding in that respect. But this broader dialogue comes back to what we were talking about earlier. We have reached a place, I think, with gun violence and with, well, unfortunately, with other issues, COVID being one of them, where uh, the debate and the conversation feels so polarized, where it feels like uh, it's become difficult for people to truly hear one another and understand different points of view. And to me, this comes back to the issue of uh, social connection uh, and community, because uh, I would, I'm going to hazard a guess here, but I would imagine that Jordan, the Governor, the two of you probably would have an easier time talking about this issue today than you would have before you got to know one another, because you have some degree of trust. You may not agree on everything, but you know each other and you know that you're uh, gen- generally good people uh, and you understand each other's values and motivations. Um, when we, it's hard to hate people up close. It's also hard uh, to ignore people or demonize them uh, when you know them. And so if we really want to have dialogue in this country, whether it's about gun violence or other topics, it really does come back to uh, us rebuilding that social fabric in our communities. Um, because otherwise it has become just too easy for us to cast people aside, to caricature them uh, as something that they're not, to assume that we know what their motivations are. Whereas reality is that we're complicated human beings. And just because we disagree on one topic doesn't mean we can't make headway uh, on addressing an issue like violence, which I believe we all care about. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. You know, um, Mental health is another area that you, and it's all connected, the loneliness, the, 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 what you talk about in guns in terms of the polarization. When we look at mental health now, the challenge that affects our kids uh, and, our, and the adults. Uh, you know, it's interesting, doctor. What I find is I think that the mental health, behavioral health issues are coming at us like a freight train. I'm engaged in several ways in, in, directly in this, this whole issue. I, get a, I have a, a suspicion that we're going to have more and more resources directed to adults, but just like so many other things, the kids are going to be left behind. I brought this up on a, another podcast. Um, do you share that concern and what can we do about it? You know, it's always the, always the kiddos that seem to get lost. 
Yeah, I'm really worried about our kids, Governor. Uh, it's one of the reasons, actually, in December, I issued a youth mental health advisory, a Surgeon General's advisory, rather, on youth mental health, um, because our kids haven't been doing well for a while. Like, you know, the pandemic certainly has taken a toll on our children, but even before the pandemic, like in the decade prior to the pandemic, there was a 57% increase in the suicide rate among young people. Um, there were rising levels of anxiety and depression. There was a- Second leading four- cause of death, uh, Jordan, between kids like- the ages, I don't know, 15 and 20, something like that. It's the second leading cause of death is, is suicide. I mean, it's just, it's shocking. And doctor, I'm involved with uh, a program called On Your Sleeves uh, out of Nationwide Children's. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'd like yeah. to tell you more about it. Do you know about it? It's a great I program. Do. Yeah. And we've been distributing, we're in a million classrooms across the country. We have a new program coming. I'd like to call you offline and tell you more about sure. it. Sure, I'd but love that. I just don't want the kids to get lost, but I'm afraid that the adults, you know, a lot of it is insurance, complicated issues. We don't have enough practitioners. Uh, we're making progress. How are we gonna? How are we gonna make even more progress? Well, I think this is the, the right question, and and I'll tell you sort of what, what I laid out in our advisory, which is a blueprint for how to address and tackle mental health for our country. Is we've got to focus on, you know, broadly speaking, three big fronts, right? On addressing the stigma around mental health, which still prevents kids today from talking about their struggles and asking for help. Uh, the second is around, uh, you know, making sure we change and impact our focus on prevention. Like, here's the thing, Governor, that, that, that really pains me. We, we have programs that we know work to reduce uh, the, the prevalence of mental health struggles among kids. These are programs that can be implemented in schools and in communities. We also know that they're cost effective. Yet, there are so few of them that are actually implemented uh, around our country. And most schools either don't know about them, don't have the funding for them, or don't have the technical assistance to actually implement them. I mean, God knows schools are being asked to do so much uh, these days. Um, but the third bucket that we really got to focus on is on the treatment side as well. Like, it takes on average 11 years from the time a child exhibits symptoms uh, of mental illness or behavioral health disorder to when they actually get evidence-based treatment. 11 years. That's 11 years where a child is struggling and 11 years where parents are also watching their kids struggle without being able to get them the help they need. And just as a parent, I'll I'll just say that that, there's no pain that I can think of that's worse than seeing your kids struggle and not being able to help them. So there are a lot of people being hurt by this. And the expansion of treatment means not only do we have to address the insurance challenge with both coverage and parity of reimbursement, but we've got to do a better job using technology to get uh, telemedicine, remote care to people where they are. We can't like expect as we have in decades past for people to make an appointment for six, eight weeks down the line when they have a crisis today and then rearrange our whole lives to drive a hundred miles uh, to that practitioner. That is just not a feasible model. Um, and so we've got to do a better job using technology to bring care to where people are. It's absolutely the case, because you said that we've got to train more mental health providers. And, and that has to be not just psychiatrists, and psychologists, we need to get counselors into schools, we need to build peer counseling programs. But some of those, um, you know, I would say more highly trained practitioners, getting more of them online will take time. So we've got to start that now, and some of that work is already underway, but we can't wait until all of them are available. We've got to make sure we increase the workforce and think about it creatively, that we use tech to bring help to people where they are. If we do all these things, the focus on stigma, prevention, and treatment, I do think we can do better by our kids, but we've got to involve them in this conversation. I've found, as I've traveled around the country, kids have a lot to say about mental health, about what's driving their struggles and also what they need. We've got to incorporate their feedback and wisdom in our approach. Doctor, I know we're running low on time, and I want to take this opportunity. I'm sitting down with America's doctor. I don't see my doctor nearly enough, so I... I'm going to use this as my own personal telehealth session. I've been diagnosed with <laughs> gout, and uh, I know it's usually a disease that people in the 1700s get, but I, a 27-year-old male, uh, have gout. And I've been told I need to cut out red meat, I need to cut out all purines and alcohol. But I read somewhere on the deep internet that gin could be beneficial and anti-inflammatory for gout. Would you sign off on gin as a potential cure or salve for gout? You know, Jordan, I would love to do you a solid, but I cannot sign off on gin as an appropriate treatment for, Come on. Uh, for gout. I'm Doctor, so sorry. he's got a behavioral issue here now. Come on. <laughs> this, Don't let also, that pass. Trust me, have this, a little bit. 
every yeah, other day. Every it's other a mental day. health issue as well, I think. <laughs> and maybe it's a good, maybe it's not just gin, like other botanicals, maybe a, a lemon rind or olive juice, uh, any of those things <laughs> beneficial for gout. Well, I have a feeling you're trying to mix those with your alcohol, so I am still worried. <laughs> you know, uh, Jordan. I'll another seek thing, another opinion. His, Thank his you very Jordan, much. Jordan's got Jordan's got a little little boy. You know, and what's interesting about this issue of uh, of mental health is that about eighty to eighty five percent of challenges that kids have that they that would exhibit themselves later could be solved, nipped right in the bud. It's such a tragedy that we spend so much money and waste so much money when these kinds of things should be a high priority. And I think working through the pediatrician and working through the primary care doctor, both with adults and with children, uh, with help given to them to diagnose the more complicated ones may be, may be the, um, the answer here. Doctor, I just have uh, two other things I'll quickly ask. Yeah. One, are we going to have to get a vaccine every year? I know you can't predict. You're not Nostradamus here. But, you know, do you think that's what's in our future, like the flu shot? Because I know people that are listening to this want to, they probably all want to know that answer. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't know for sure, but I think people we should be prepared for the fact that it is a possibility, you know, just like with the flu, you know, the flu is a, a vaccine where we actually adjust the vaccine each year based on what we think the most common uh, versions of the flu are that are going to be circulating. And we may end up having to do something similar with, with the coronavirus. And we've seen actually how quickly it is mutating and, and evolving. And so that may be very well something that we have to do on a regular basis, whether that's annually whether that's every three years or, or more infrequently, we don't quite know yet. Uh, partly what we have to do is see how long people's protection lasts to help guide us as to when we need to uh, to boost that again. Right. The last personal question I have, Jordan, yeah. I have a, a daughter who's going to graduate either uh, summa cum laude or cum laude, really high grade point, wants to go to medical school. You got to go through the MCAT. Uh, you know, it's why with the shortage of practitioners, why is it so darn difficult to get into medical school? And why don't we make it easier for people to get in the medical school and make it difficult for them to get out? You know, it it's just seems so crazy to me when we have these shortages that we make it so, I mean, to watch what my daughter's gone through just drives me up the wall in terms of, of, of how we do this. Tell me what, uh, and I hope I didn't just keep her from getting into medical school with those comments, you know, but <laughs> we, need to, we need to think about this and address this because it's the fair thing and I think the right thing to do. Well, look, I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's too hard to get into medical school. Uh, I think we need to be training more and more doctors. And I also think we have to be thoughtful about what makes a good doctor, that it's not yeah. about just doing good on a standardized test that, you know, is one day of your life. Uh, it's it's about your broader set of skills, your ability to be empathetic and compassionate, your ability to think critically uh, and evolve as new information presents itself. Um, and that's so much more than just how you do uh, on a given day on a test. I also think we've got to reduce the barriers to people uh, going through medical school, which include the tuition barrier. Uh, it is so incredibly expensive yeah. to go to medical school, and that keeps people out. Uh, who otherwise could could get into school and be great providers. And right now we've got a, a healthcare system which needs more representation. Uh, we have uh, we have so such a small portion, for example, uh, of of black doctors in our country who make up the broader uh, profession of doctors. Um, that I I worry that we do not uh, we're not doing a good job in making sure that the healthcare workforce represents the people that we are seeking to serve. Uh, so for multiple reasons, we've got to make it easier for people to get. Uh, you know, into the medical training system. That doesn't mean we should lower our standards in terms of making sure people are capable Correct. and skilled Correct. when they come out, uh, right. you know, of medical school. They, they've got to be good. Um, but I think that we we, we got to let more people into that system and broaden our view of what makes a good doctor. If I could just also just say one last thing on a separate topic. Governor, when you ran for president, there was a speech you gave like a, toward the end of, of, your, uh, of your time running where you talked about the importance of, of love and community. And that speech like has stuck with me over the years. And I've been actually thinking about it like during this conversation here, because I, I really think that as big as the challenges are that we're facing, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's, uh, you know, health disparities or whether it's gun violence or other issues, uh, I do think that so much of what we need to help us going forward with our health and just more broadly as a society is to re 
connect with one another, to really get back in touch with those core values of love and community and generosity and compassion uh, that ultimately make for a healthy society. And my hope, uh, and this may, uh, you know, this may be too, uh, too, too hopeful perhaps, but I don't think it is. My hope is that we can use this moment of COVID-19 uh, to ask ourselves the deeper question of how do we really want to be living our lives? What kind of society do we really want uh, to live in together? And then have that conversation together. Because my suspicion is that even though the airwaves make it seem like we're hopelessly polarized, that there are common hopes and dreams that we share. We all want our kids to be safe and to be well. We all want there to be opportunity available uh, to people across our country. But we all want uh, to know uh, that we'll be taken care of if we get ill. Um, there are common hopes we have. And yes. I just, I think because we are hardwired to connect with one another, because I do believe our best instincts and natural instincts are to be caring and compassionate for one another. I, I have hope that we can reconnect with that, but, but that's what I feel like we really need to do now as a country. Yeah, that's a, thank you, doctor. And, you know, uh, Jordan, what I found on the trail as I went on is it wasn't about my tax cut plan or my is a fact that I wanted to know what was going on inside of you. You know, what are your pains? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? Uh, look, we don't always do it. We're in a hurry. We just move so fast. But if we want to live a life a little bigger than ourselves, you know, slow down, care about somebody, right? And it, it'll change the world. And I'm optimistic, doctor, that because uh, people like you and Jordan and these young people that are out there, we're just not chasing money now. They they know there's something more important than, in life than just some financial success or professional success. So, you know, treat everybody else like you want them to treat you. You're you're a fine man. I've enjoyed this today, Jordan. Thanks for having the idea of bringing the doctor on. I think it's been just terrific, and I hope people find some things useful here. Well said. And uh, Dacha, you didn't happen to watch any of my old speeches, did you? Or, <laughs> or web series? There's, there's a couple on YouTube that are are pretty insightful. I'll send you well, a I link. will say, Jordan, some, I have watched many of your pieces and they've helped. Uh, I use them as stress relievers because they always make me laugh. <laughs> so. may, may I provide you that weird squishy ball on your desk? That's uh, That's my gift to you. Uh, well, to learn more you. about U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Morthy's work to help lay the foundation for a healthier country, you can visit SurgeonGeneral.gov or follow him on Twitter at Surgeon underscore General. Uh, Dr. Morthy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation with both of you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Me. God bless, doctor. God bless you, too. Hey, everybody. Jordan here, uh, your favorite host of the Kasich Klepper podcast. Thank you for listening this far. If you like what you hear, click like or thumbs up or whatever icon signifies a positive reaction. We love your ratings. We love your thoughts. Reach out to us on social media. Let us know what you want us to talk about because I'm tired of answering the governor's questions and I just prefer to answer yours. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kugler. Line producer is Oscar Guido. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort, with production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by Acast.